right there, I have a positive potential, and on the other side, I have a negative potential. And whatever potential that there is on the positive side of the battery is going to be transmitted without any diminish, diminution to the positive side of the resistor. And so you could think of that side of the resistor at high electrical pressure. On the other hand, the low side of the battery is at low electrical pressure. So this wire that's connected to the negative side of the resistor is also at low ele electrical pressure. And since I have ideal wires, then we're going to say that the difference of potential across the battery is going to be the same as the difference in potential across the resistor. And since there are 30 volts across the battery, then there are also going to be 30 volts across the resistor. The resistor experiences a voltage drop of 30 volts. Part B. What is the current through the resistor? We're going to solve this using Ohm's law. The current is going to be the voltage drop across the resistor, the 30 volts that we just found in part A, divided by the resistance of the resistor, which is 5 ohms. And I get 6 amperes. In other words, 6 coulombs per second flow through this resistor. All right, so I've got charges that are moving through the resistor. You think of the positive charge motion. It's going through the resistor. It's coming back through this wire. Now, what's happening in the battery? Well, the battery basically acts like a pump. It's a charge pump, and what happens is it takes that coulomb that's at low energy on the negative side of the battery, and it boosts its energy to have high energy on the positive side of the battery. Now, again, we're talking about a conventional current. If the positive charges could move, then that's the direction that they would move. And so I get the same amount of charge per second passing through the battery as I do passing through the resistor. There are six amperes of current flowing through the battery. Now let's go to focus on resistance a bit. What is resistance? Well, in an electric circuit, when we talk about resistance, what we're discussing is something that inhibits the motion of charge in a circuit. The resistance may be a conductor, I mean, I could have a wire that is somehow the structure of the wire presents obstacles or barriers to the movement of charge through it. I realize that I'm kind of talking out of both sides of my mouth here when I say, well, wires are ideal conductors, but then we can have wires that have resistance to them. But the fact is that whenever charge moves through a circuit, there is going to be something that basically produces, if you want to think of it as internal friction to the move motion of the charge, then in resistance can be thought of as this internal friction. The things that determine the resistance are the dimensions of the resistor and what the resistor is made out of. And there's a relationship between the resistance of the circuit and other quantities. So let's think about a cylindrical resistor or maybe a rectangular resistor if you prefer. Let's say that the length of the resistor is a distance L, lowercase l, or uppercase if you prefer, it doesn't matter. And we could talk about the cross-sectional area of one face of the resistor. And that cross-sectional area might be pi r squared, say in the case of the round resistor, or it could be the length times the width of the face of the rectangular resistor. It turns out that the longer the object is, the more it resists charge moving through it. And the fatter the resistor is, in other words, the bigger the cross-sectional area, the less the resistance is. The formula for the resistance looks something like this. The resistance R, that's the number that appears in Ohm's law, is equal to something called the resistivity, this is rho, that's not density, in this context it means resistivity, times the length, L, divided by the cross-sectional area, A. So if I want to figure out what the resistance of a material is, then I look at these characteristics, I look at the dimensions of the resistor, and I put it all together, and I can get a numerical value for the resistance. Table 43.1 shows you the resistivity of common materials. Resistivity basically is a characteristic of a material that tells you how easy or how difficult it is for charge to move through the circuit. Now, you don't need to memorize any of these numbers. 
These are not any of my best friends at all. I look these up anytime I need to use them. But what I want you to see is that silver in this table is the very best of the resistors. Copper is pretty good. And that's why you see many wires in houses made out of copper. Silver is a precious metal. Copper is easier to come by, not as precious, and it's a pretty good conductor. On the other hand, you have some things that are not so good, like glass. Down here, glass would be considered an insulator. And so semiconductors such as germanium and silicon and even carbon to some extent, these things down here are not as good and in fact their resistance will depend very much on what other impurities are present. Sometimes the germanium and the silicon can be made to be very good resistors or they could be made to be very good conductors depending on what they are doped with. Doped means what other substances are mixed with them. You're going to need some of these numbers to solve some problems in your text. So let's solve one right now. The last example in this section is 43.5. The resistance of a piece of wire is 20 ohms. What would be the resistance if the length of the wire is doubled and the cross-sectional area is halved? Alright, well let's work this problem. This is kind of a conceptual idea, but let's try it anyway. So I've got this piece of wire, and they tell me that the resistance of this particular section of wire is 20 ohms. And I know that the resistance is equal to the resistivity times the length divided by the area. This wire has a certain length to it, and it has a certain cross-sectional area here as a result of the face of this. Now, let's suppose that we take another piece of wire that is made of the identical material. And let's let the cross-sectional area of that piece of wire be half of the original piece of wire. And I'm going to make the wire longer. I'm going to double the length of the wire. Now, I'm trying to figure out what's the resistance of my new piece of wire. Well, this resistance is going to be rho times L prime divided by A prime. In other words, my new resistance is going to be the resistivity, which in this case is the same as the resistivity of the original piece of wire. I've got the same piece of wire, the same material. The length is doubled, the area is halved. Now, let's put that all together. Now, let me put these numbers out front. And since rho L over A is equal to 20 ohms, then I've got 4 times 20 ohms, or 80 ohms as my new resistance. Graphically, I can show this using a simulation. In this simulation, I have the ability to vary the resistivity, the length, and the cross-sectional area of a piece of wire. In this piece of wire, which is cylindrical, the dots represent obstacles to the charge. In other words, the more dots there are, the harder it is for electrons to pass through this circuit. Now, what happens is if I slide these bars, you can see that as the resistivity increases, in other words, as the material gets more and more obstacles to the charge carriers, then the resistance increases. Likewise, if those obstacles are removed, so say if I had a piece of silver here, there would be very few obstacles to charges passing through, and I have a low resistance. All right? Let's check the length of the wire. If I make the wire longer and longer, then I get more and more obstacles to the wire, to the charge motion in the wire, because I'm adding more obstacles to it. If I make the wire short, then the resistance shrinks because I put fewer and fewer obstacles in the way of the charge. And the same is true for a cross-sectional area. The larger the cross-sectional area, the easier it is for charge to find its way, the electrons to find its way around the obstacles. On the other hand, if I make the cross-sectional area small, then all the charges have to pass through. So you can imagine the cross-sectional area being like doors that are open to get into or out of a building. If you think about the science building, there are four doors there. If you have one door open, 
that corresponds to a low area. And if you had 100 people trying to pass through that door at once, you would find it difficult to get through. On the other hand, if you open all the doors at the same time, now you provide many alternate paths for the people to try to get through. So 100 people would be able to pass through more easily. In other words, the resistance to the motion of those people through the doors is a lot less when you have a wider opening. There's one more simulation that I would like to show you, which I think is pretty cool. It allows you to build your own circuit. So let me build a circuit. I'm going to take a battery here. And you can see the battery has some charges that are there. I'm going to take a wire and attach it to one end of this battery. And I can make the wire long or short, whatever I want. Let me take a light bulb and put it in this circuit. And let me connect another wire to this light bulb. And now let me put a switch in this circuit. And I'm going to take a wire and connect to the other end of this switch. And now if I want to make electricity to flow, then I can close the switch and you can see that I get charge motion. The battery is pushing charge through the circuit. Now they're showing the motion of electrons in this circuit. So what's happening is the electrons are represented by these little dots that are here. If I open the switch, let me see if I can open the switch, then I get this motion of charges to stop in the circuit. One other thing that's cool is I can add a voltmeter to this circuit. And if I do that, this is like a multimeter here, like we used in class. And this particular battery has a voltage of 9 volts. So this would be like a transistor battery. If I close the switch in the circuit, then I get a difference in potential across this battery of 9 volts. 9 joules per coulomb are being impressed on the charges of this circuit. If I wanted to measure the current in this circuit, then I could get an ammeter. And now I take this ammeter and I'm going to insert it in the circuit here. Let me see if I can do that. It looks like what I should have done was to have inserted my ammeter in the circuit before I um, built the whole thing. I have something that's called a non-contact ammeter, and so I'm going to change this. And this tells me that I have 0 0.9 amperes flowing through this circuit right now. Well, if I have 9 volts and 0.9 amperes, I could figure out what the resistance of the bulb is. You could use Ohm's Law to help you figure that out. So reviewing just quickly, we've talked about the idea of electric current, We've talked about voltage. We've discussed Ohm's law, the relationship between voltage, current, and resistance in a circuit. And we've discussed the things that characterize resistance and calculating the resistance based on resistivity and the dimensions of the wire. So for this lesson, that's it.